Hello, welcome to Credit Matters TV. I'm Jeff Sexton. Today I'm joined by Stuart Plesser for discussion of the Fed's unwinding of the quantitative easing program and the potential impact on U.S. banks. Stuart, thank you for joining us. Hey, Jeff. Good to be here. Stuart, so let's talk a little bit about what we discussed in the article, which is what could this mean for bank deposits? Well, as you know, uh, we've been operating in a low interest rate environment for quite some time. And so um, one of the aspects is the Fed is talking about um, raising rates. Our estimate from our economists is second quarter of 2015. And that's primarily where the market is in terms of a rate rise in, in 2015. And the question is going to become is banks have had an inflow of non-interest deposits, some of it connected with QE and some of it just because the opportunity cost of putting that to work there's not much to be gained and they're keeping it as a non-interest deposit waiting. So the question is going to become is, you know, well, if rates start to rise, will these deposits start to flow out of banks? And so what we did in the article is we, we looked at 2008 to 2013 and looked at what is the growth of these deposits during that time period, which banks grew those the most, and, and, and bigger than proportionally uh, historic or the recent proportion of overall deposit growth. And we said, these banks may be susceptible to runoffs of deposits, and then how would it impact our own funding ratios? What, what would it need to take to run out? Perhaps they have to pay up for these deposits. And so there's a lot of permutations that we get into based on deposit runoffs. And, and overall, banks should benefit from higher rates um, because they're able to, the spread yield will, will be better for the banks, but some might need to pay up more than others for deposits, and, and this is part of the whole equation that goes on with a rate rise. That's an interesting point, as we've seen a number of bank regulations put in place in the last few years. And as we think about the potential move in interest rates and this potential move in bank deposits, could you talk a little bit more about the leverage ratio and how that may be impacted? So one of the positive aspects for banks of deposit runoff of these non-interest deposit runoffs is that some of them have been collecting these non-interest deposits really against their will. This has been a safe haven for particularly trust banks of deposits uh, being parked there waiting to do something with these deposits. And so the leverage ratio penalizes banks by for having a bigger asset side um, of their balance sheet and liabilities uh, on the deposit side. And so when these deposits would run off, this would improve the leverage ratio of these banks. And so what we looked at from our own standpoint, we looked at common equity over assets, which is a much more simplified of what the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio is. It doesn't take into account off balance sheet um, uh, increases um, in terms of commitments. But on the whole, it's a, it's a good proxy. And, and based on our analysis, a 5% deposit runoff would equate to about a 40 bit beneficial on the leverage ratio probably lower on the regulatory ratios because the assets are much bigger than our own version, but you could figure that um, in the 20 to, to 30 BIP area on the regulatory ratio should be the benefit for these banks. When we think about those deposit runoffs, that brings in another player in the equation, which is money market funds. How could their role in this equation be impacted by money market fund regulation? So money markets are an interesting part of the equation. Um, basically, these non-interest bearing deposits could make their way to money market funds when rates go up, um, short-term rates go up. One of the aspects, as you mentioned, with money markets is that they have also uh, um, have new regulation in place. Basically, there, there is um, gates in terms of leaving some of these funds, and there's also floating values. And government money market funds don't, do not have these gates or floating values, so the question is going to become is, will money flow into just the government portion or will it move across the board and we'll see how that pans out but money market funds will likely get more flow and um, and perhaps will then lend back to the banks in forms of commercial paper or cds and it would be a higher costing form of deposit for the banks that the money market is 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 generating for them so when we're thinking about those flows in the money market funds where does the feds re repo program fit into the picture the reverse repo program uh, of the of the fed is um, is an interesting angle that they're experimenting with and, and there are certain limits to it and and so one of the one of the benefits of it one of the reasons for this reverse repo program is to try to get the fed funds rate equal to the excess reserve rate but it's also another vehicle for where money market funds could invest some of the money that comes into their uh, to the money market funds and and so that, that basically they would be 
borrowing, this, the Fed would be um, lending out its own securities and, and paying a rate for this, and this would be the rate that money markets would get. And so some of the money that comes into the money market funds, they would use in this reverse repo program and, and take the Fed securities, and that's where they would invest the funds. The problem is it's not a big program now, and it likely will not get much bigger. And so the real question is, Will there be enough securities out there for money markets to invest in if they get this increase of flow coming from non-interest deposits? So taking all that into account from a credit perspective, what could be the impact on ratings of both a rise in interest rates, but also potentially of a sustained period, continued sustained period of low interest rates? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the second point because there's no certainty that rates will rise in 2015. There are a lot of pressures on why they wouldn't. There's also pressure on even if they do rise, whether the long end of the curve is going to rise accordingly. Um, and so one of the risks is, is that rates don't rise for an extended period of time, and that would just continue to have net interest margin pressure on banks and perhaps create asset bubbles in the economy and a search for yield. And so there's no immediate impact, but if that goes on longer and longer, this could have a, a negative ratings impact. Um, on the rate rise section, we think banks are pretty set up for a gradual rates, uh, rise in rates and also um, the economy improving. I mean, that's an important caveat is if rates are rising, the economy really needs to be improving. And so they're set up for it should benefit their bottom lines and, and, and they generate loan growth at basically higher rates and their, shorter, their floating rate loans should also improve. But um, we think that um, there could be unintended consequences along the way, and some of what we point out is this outflow of deposits and this rejiggering of the system will be an interesting phenomenon to watch. So an area of considerable interest from a number of different fronts. With that, I'd like to thank Stuart Plesser for joining us. And from all of us here in Standard & Poor's, thank you and take care.